Okay. Have you ever felt just incredibly thirsty? Like a thirst you just can't seem to quench no matter how much water you drink. Yeah, that deep down dryness. Exactly. And maybe uh, combined with needing the bathroom constantly, day, night, it just doesn't stop. Hmm. Sounds pretty disruptive. Well, today we're doing a deep dive into a condition that takes those feelings and really ramps them up. We're talking about diabetes insipidus. D-I, for short. Right off the bat, that name diabetes probably makes everyone think of blood sugar, right? Diabetes mellitus. Absolutely. It's a super common association. But it's really important to understand D-I is completely different. We're not dealing with glucose or insulin here at all. Right. So for this discussion, let's almost like set aside the blood sugar thing entirely. DI is all about how your body manages water. Precisely. And the star player in this whole process is a hormone called ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Something called vasopressin too, yeah. That's the one. It's basically the body's master water controller. Okay. So our mission today is to really unpack DI. What is it? Why does it happen? How does it show up? We'll be using the info we gathered in this, uh, untitled document here as our guide, trying to break down the complexity into stuff that makes sense. Those aha moments, hopefully. Let's do it. Okay. So first things first, what actually is diabetes insipidus? We mentioned the thirst, the urination. That's the core of it, really. Excessive thirst, the medical term is polydipsia mm -hmm. and producing huge amounts of very dilute urine. That's polyuria. Okay. Polydipsia, yeah. polyuria. Got it. And it's worth noting, it's actually quite a rare disorder which provides some context. Rare, sure, but obviously a massive deal if you're experiencing it. So what's fundamentally going wrong? It all comes down to problems with that hormone, ADH. Either your body isn't making enough, it's not releasing it properly, or your kidneys just aren't listening to it. Okay, ADH is key. Yeah. So normally, what's its job? How does it keep our water balance in check? Well, ADH basically tells your kidneys how much water to hang on to. It targets these tiny structures, the collecting ducts in the kidneys. Right. And it signals them to pull water back out of the urine and return it to your bloodstream. This concentrates the urine and stops you from losing too much fluid. Makes sense, like a water conservation signal. Exactly. So if ADH isn't doing its job right, that whole system kind of breaks down. Hmm. Which brings us to the different types, because it's not just one single problem, is it? No, not at all. There are actually four main types of DI, and each one has a pretty distinct cause. Understanding these differences is uh, really crucial. All right, let's break them down then. First up is central DI, sometimes called neurogenic DI. Yep, central or neurogenic. With this type, the main issue is simply a shortage of ADH. There's a problem somewhere in the brain, either the hypothalamus where it's made or the pituitary gland where it's released. And our source mentions some reasons why that might happen, like what could damage that part of the brain. Yeah, things like head injuries, unfortunately, brain tumors, sometimes pituitary surgery itself can disrupt it. Even infections like meningitis or encephalitis can be a cause. And in very rare cases, it can be down to specific genetic mutations. So basically anything that messes with the ADH factory or the delivery system. Pretty much. If you don't have enough ADH getting into your bloodstream, the signal doesn't reach the kidneys properly. Got it. Oh, type number two, nephrogenic DI. How's this one different? So with nephrogenic DI, the brain, the pituitary, uh. they're usually doing their job fine. There's enough ADH being produced and released. Mm -hmm. But the problem lies with the kidneys. They aren't responding to the ADH signal. It's like the message is sent, but the receiver isn't working. Okay, so the kidneys are resistant. Why would that happen? Well, several reasons. Again, genetics can play a role. The source mentions a specific gene, the AVPR2 Dane. If that's faulty, the ADH receptor in the kidney might not function correctly. Interesting. Also, chronic kidney disease itself can make kidneys less responsive. And certain medications are known, of culprits lithium is a big one. Oh, right. I've heard that connection. Yeah, lithium, also demeclocycline, amphotericin B, these can interfere. And finally, imbalances in electrolytes, like um, too much calcium or too little potassium in your blood can also disrupt kidney function. So even with ADH floating around, if the kidneys can't use it or something's blocking it, the water saving fails. Mm. Big difference from central DI. Huge difference. Okay, number three is dipsogenic DI, also called primary polydipsia. This sounds different again. It is quite different. Here, the primary issue isn't really ADH production or kidney response. It's driven by drinking excessive amounts of fluid. Drinking too much water. 
Essentially, yes. And this constant overhydration can actually suppress the body's natural release of ADH over time. So your body thinks, whoa, too much water coming in, better turn down the water saving hormone. That's a good way to think about it. And the source points to a couple of reasons for the success of drinking. One is psychogenic polydipsia, which can be linked to some mental health conditions. No. The other is actual damage to the thirst mechanism in the hypothalamus. If that part of the brain isn't regulating thirst properly, you might feel intensely thirsty even when you don't physiologically need water. Wow, so your own thirst signal could be misleading you. That's complex. Yeah. Okay, fourth and final type, gestational DI. Sounds like it's related to pregnancy. Exactly. This one occurs specifically during pregnancy. The placenta produces an enzyme called vasopressinase. Vasopressinase. And yeah. this enzyme's job is basically to break down the mother's ADH. So even if mom's brain is making ADH just fine, this enzyme from the placenta is essentially getting rid of it. That's right. It degrades the ADH in her bloodstream. Mm. But the good news is... The good news, as the source highlights, is that it almost always resolves after the baby is delivered. Once the placenta is gone, the enzyme is gone, and ADH levels usually return to normal. That must be a huge relief for women who experience it. Okay, so those are the four types. Central, yeah. nephrogenic, dipsogenic, gestational, each messing with ADH or water balance in a unique way. Let's dig into the how a bit more. How does this actually play out physiologically? Right. So, quick recap of normal. Hypothalamus makes ADH, posterior pituitary releases it, mm -hmm. it travels to the kidneys, tells the collecting ducts reabsorb water. Result, concentrated urine. Got it. So, in central DI. No ADH or very little. So that signal to reabsorb water is weak or missing. Kidneys can't pull water back effectively. Result, lots and lots of dilute urine polyuria. Makes sense. And nephrogenic DI. ADH is there. Often normal levels, maybe even high levels because the body's trying to compensate. Right. But the kidneys are resistant. They ignore the signal. Mm. So water isn't reabsorbed properly. Result. Again, lots of dilute urine. So same outcome. Massive urine output, but totally different reasons. Lack of signal versus ignored signal. Precisely. And knowing which one it is, that's absolutely critical for figuring out how to treat it. Okay. So we know what's happening inside. What are the outward signs? What might someone actually notice? Well, the big ones we keep mentioning, polyuria and polydipsia. Mm -hmm. And the polyuria can be extreme. The source mentions figures like 3 to 20 liters of urine per day. 20 liters. That's staggering. It really puts it in perspective. It does. And of course, if you're losing that much fluid, you're going to feel incredibly thirsty. That's the polydipsia, trying to keep up. Makes sense. Another common thing is nocturia having to get up frequently during the night to urinate, which, you know, is incredibly disruptive to sleep and just quality of life. I can only imagine. Exhausting. What happens if someone just can't drink enough water to match that output? That's where it gets dangerous. Dehydration becomes a major risk. You might see signs like a really dry mouth, dry skin, mm. a fast heart rate, maybe low blood pressure, feeling really lethargic and tired. Okay. And in severe cases, this dehydration can lead to a serious imbalance called hypernatremia that's dangerously high sodium levels in the blood. So these are definitely not symptoms to ignore. How do doctors figure out if it is DI, and which type? Diagnosis usually involves a few key steps. One of the main tests is the water deprivation test. Okay, water deprivation test. Sounds unpleasant. What does it involve? It is pretty much what it sounds like. You're asked to stop drinking fluids for a specific period, uh -huh. maybe four hours, maybe up to 18, under close medical supervision, of course. Right. And during that time, they monitor things very carefully. How concentrated your urine gets, that's urine osmolality. They also check your blood concentration, serum osmolality, plus your weight, heart rate, blood pressure. Okay. And what are they looking for? How does this tell them what's going on? Normally, if you stop drinking, your body conserves water, ADH kicks in, and your urine should get much more concentrated. Right. Hold on to water. But in central DI, without enough ADH, your urine stays dilute, even when you're dehydrated. In nephrogenic DI, same result, the urine stays dilute because the kidneys can't respond to ADH, even if it's there. Okay, so both types show dilute urine even after water deprivation. How do they tell central from nephrogenic then? That's the next step. They often follow the water deprivation test with an ADH or vasopressin test. They give you a dose of synthetic ADH, usually desmopressin. Oh, oh now, yeah. if you have central DI, the problem was lack of ADH. Giving you synthetic ADH will work. Your kidneys will respond, and your urine will finally become more concentrated. Because you've supplied the missing signal. Exactly. But if you have nephrogenic DI, the kidneys are resistant. Giving extra ADH won't make much difference. The urine will stay dilute because the kidneys still aren't responding properly. 
That's pretty clever, a clear way to distinguish them. Are there other tests involved, like blood work? Yeah, definitely. Blood tests might show that high sodium, the hypernatremia, if dehydration is significant. Urine tests confirm the low concentration, the low osmolality, and measuring actual ADH levels in the blood can be helpful too. How so? Well, in central DI, you'd expect ADH levels to be low. But in nephrogenic DI, the levels might actually be normal or even high because the brain is trying harder to get the kidneys to respond. Okay, so putting all those pieces together gives a clear picture. Once you have the diagnosis, what about treatment? Treatment really has to be tailored to the specific type. For central DI, the main goal is replacing that missing ADH. With the synthetic stuff, desmopressin. Exactly. DDAVP or desmopressin. It comes in different forms. Nasal spray, pills, sometimes injections. The key is carefully adjusting the dose based on urine output to get the water balance just right. Right. Not too much, not too little. What about nephrogenic DI, where giving ADH doesn't help? That's trickier. Interestingly, a type of diuretic called a thiazide diuretic can actually help reduce urine volume in nephrogenic DI. It seems paradoxical, but it works through a complex mechanism. A diuretic reduces urine. Oh, okay. That's counterintuitive. Yeah. It is. Also, certain anti-inflammatory drugs, like indomethacin, can sometimes help improve the kidney's response slightly. A low-sodium diet is usually really important, too, as it reduces the overall amount of fluid the kidneys need to excrete. Makes sense. And, of course, if a medication like lithium is the cause, stopping that drug, if possible, is crucial. Right. Treat the underlying cause. Okay, what about gestational DI? Desmopressin works well there, too, because the synthetic ADH isn't broken down by that placental enzyme, the vasopressinase, so it manages symptoms effectively during pregnancy. Good to know. And finally, dipsogenic DI, the excessive drinking one. There, the focus really has to be on the underlying reason for the excessive water intake. If it's psychogenic polydipsia, behavioral therapy can be key to help manage the compulsion to drink. Address the root cause again. Exactly. If the thirst mechanism itself is damaged, it can be very challenging to manage, often involving strict fluid monitoring and strategies to avoid overhydration. So definitely different strategies for different types. What happens if DI isn't managed well? Are there serious complications? Yes, definitely. Severe dehydration is the big immediate risk, which can even lead to hypovolemic shock where your blood volume gets dangerously low. Wow, life-threatening. It can be, yes. Also, those electrolyte imbalances, especially the high sodium, can cause neurological problems. Long term, the constant high urine flow can sometimes stretch the bladder and lead to bladder dysfunction. And we shouldn't overlook the potential link between compulsive water drinking and underlying psychiatric issues in some cases. So really important to get it diagnosed and treated properly. Now, just to clarify things for people listening, how does DI differ from other conditions that might seem similar? The big one is obviously diabetes mellitus. Right. Absolutely. Critical distinction. Diabetes mellitus is about blood sugar and insulin. High blood glucose, often glucose in the urine. A diabetes insipidus is about water balance and ADH. Blood sugar is typically normal. No glucose in the urine due to the DI itself. Totally different hormones, different systems involved. Okay, got it. Sugar versus water. What about distinguishing it from that psychogenic polydipsia we mentioned? That can be trickier because the symptoms, drinking a lot, urinating a lot of dilute urine, look similar. But the underlying cause is different. In psychogenic polydipsia, there isn't a primary ADH problem. The ADH might even be low because of all the water intake. The water deprivation test is usually key to telling them apart. The test reveals the underlying ADH function, or lack thereof. Precisely. And maybe chronic kidney disease? Could that be confused? Possibly, because kidney disease can affect urine concentration. But usually, chronic kidney disease comes with a whole host of other signs of kidney failure, like high blood pressure, other electrolyte issues, waste products building up in the blood. You don't typically see those just from DI alone. Okay, so looking at the bigger picture helps differentiate. This has been incredibly informative. So to kind of wrap up the main takeaway, diabetes insipidus is all about water balance, controlled by ADH, not blood sugar. Exactly. And it's not one single condition, but several types. Central, nephrogenic, dipsogenic, gestational, each with its own cause affecting how ADH works or how the kidneys respond. It highlights just how complex, seemingly simple things like thirst and urination actually are in the body. And underscores why getting the right diagnosis, mm -hmm. often using that water deprivation test, is so vital for finding the right treatment path. Absolutely. 
Which kind of leads to a final thought, maybe. When you consider how incredibly finely tuned this whole water regulation system is, mm -hmm. it makes you wonder what other everyday bodily functions that seem simple on the surface have these surprisingly intricate mechanisms ticking away underneath? That's a great question. Really makes you appreciate the complexity inside us. A lot to think about. If any of this discussion sparked questions or concerns for you listening, definitely seek out reliable medical info or chat with your healthcare provider. Definitely. Thanks so much for breaking all that down for us today. My pleasure. It's a fascinating topic. 